The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good evening, everyone. And thank you for joining this virtual meeting regarding the 13th and 8th Avenue Railroad Grade Separation in the City of Terre Haute Informational Meeting. My name is Scott Carr, and I will be uh, facilitating tonight's information presentation and additional discussion to follow, concluding the presentation. Uh, before we begin this evening, I'd like to take a moment to recognize some individuals who are present for our meeting this evening. From the engineering team and from Butler Fairman, we have Michael Mattel, Bridge Project Manager, Troy Willard, Traffic Production Manager, Michael Mang, Vice President, Brent Friend, Right-of-Way Department Manager, from the Indiana Department of Transportation, we have Jason Springer, Senior Project Manager, and Jason Holder, Tracks Program Manager. From the City of Terre Haute, we have Mayor Duke Bennett. Thank you for joining us this evening, Mr. Mayor, and Chuck Ennis, City Engineer. Additionally, we have Marcus Maurer, Assistant City Engineer, who we would like to uh, extend a special thank you to for all of his hard work helping facilitate tonight's presentation. In just a moment, we'll begin a pre-recorded presentation to review the upcoming project in Terre Haute. We ask that you please submit your questions via the chat feature in the control panel of the GoToWebinar or by virtually raising your hand in the same panel following the conclusion of the presentation. All questions will be answered at the end of the presentation and we will do our best to answer those in the order in which they are received. Following the presentation, we will have interactions with those who have done the work and who are working on the design and implementation of this project. Several engineers and other members of the team will be available to answer questions. I believe at this time, we could begin the presentation. Hello, my name is Mike Mattel, and I'm the project manager, as well as the bridge lead on this project. I've been with our company for over 35 years, and this is the first time that I have ever given a virtual presentation. So I hope that all this goes well. I want to thank you for, talk, for taking the time to listen and participate in this meeting tonight. And I hope that we can provide you with the necessary information. To give you a little background on the project, our firm was hired by the Indiana Department of Transportation to be the designer of this project. Prior to NDOT hiring our firm, a, a study was done for the city of Terre Haute on how to deal with the at-grade crossings at 8th at Avenue and 13th Street. As you all know, the project is located within the city limits of Terre Haute in the northeast section of the city. The CSX railroad line runs in a northeast to southwest direction and is located southeast of the intersection of 8th Avenue and 13th Street. The limits of the project will extend approximately about a quarter of a mile along each leg from the intersection of 8th Avenue and 13th Street. According to a recent railroad corridor study that was done for the city of Terre Haute, there are two railroads corridors located at the project site. This study indicated that currently that are more than 21 trains per day at this location and it was forecasted that the amount of train traffic would increase. Often trains will stop or slow down as they transverse through this corridor creating delays for motorists when these crossings are temporarily blocked. With Union Hospital which is located about a half a mile west of the project is very difficult for first responders, EMS, ambulances to avoid delays caused by the blocked crossings. Our study showed 
that the speed of these trains that are going through this intersection can vary from 15 to 35 miles an hour. The purpose of this project is to improve the safety and the mobility of the public by addressing the adverse effects of the current ag grade crossings at the project's location. When we build the bridges to carry the motoring public and pedestrians over this railroad, their safety will be greatly improved by reducing the potential for a train, vehicle, or pedestrian collision while reducing emergency response times. Now this is a win-win situation for both the motoring public and CSX Railroad, since CSX operations will be maintained throughout construction and their risks and concerns will be decreased by eliminating the two existing at-grade crossings. Now traffic flow along 13th Street as well as 8th Avenue will be improved since there will be no longer that waiting time for those trains. Now I'd like to provide you with some information with regards to the railroad. As you all know, the current at grade crossings on 13th Avenue and 8th Street, there are gate arms and flashing red lights at each location. As I mentioned earlier, the trains can sometimes go pretty slow and be quite aggravating as you wait in your car for the trains to cross. But on the most part, these trains travel at a pretty good speed through here, up to 35 miles an hour through the intersections. On average, you may have to wait probably around five to 10 minutes in your car for the train to pass, but it sure seems like a lot longer. Creating a grade separation crossing at this location will improve safety for the motoring public as well as the railroad operations. According to accident reports supplied from the Federal Railroad Administration, there have been 22 accidents between trains and the motoring public at these crossings since 1976. Included in these accidents, there were two fatalities and five injuries reported. Whatever we do for a bridge design to go over the railroad, we have to meet certain criteria for the railroad. But the main design criteria that we have to meet is that the bottom of the bridge is at least 23 feet above the top of the railroad tracks. This way, the railroad knows how high they can stack their cars for their trip. The railroad doesn't want to have an accident when they go underneath the new bridge. We have to provide this vertical clearance over each existing track, as well as we coordinate with the railroad to see if they have any future plans to expand and add other tracks. So we have to provide this 23 feet vertical clearance for the future tracks as well. For this project, we coordinated with CSX Railroad to find out what they owned in terms of right-of-way at the project location. We found out that CSX owns a 100 foot wide corridor in this area. Well, another thing that the railroads have been quite particular about lately is they want you to span their entire right of way. So we have to build a bridge that spans the entire railroad corridor without placing any type of piers or any other construction items on their property. This way, during construction, the railroad will be able to keep their trains and railway line in service. We will need to coordinate with them for some temporary shutdown times whenever we come to the point in the bridge construction to lift and place the beams for the bridge span. Another feature that this project will impact 
can, uh, is with utilities. With this being an urban area, there are many utilities either buried underground or on power poles. Through early coordination, we were able to identify nine different utilities that were either in or near the project area. One of the major utilities of this project is Duke Energy. They have power poles currently located along 8th Avenue. In addition to Duke having aerial lines on these power poles, there are a couple other utilities hanging on these power poles as well. Since we will be raising the road and the bridge over the railroad, Duke will also need to raise their poles as well. Another significant utility that the project will be impacting is Indiana American Water. This utility has several water main lines located underground throughout the project that will need to be relocated. The city of Terre Haute also has their combined sewer along the roadway centerline of both 8th Avenue and 13th Street. One of the sewer lines is an old 48 inch brick sewer line that undoubtedly needs to be replaced since the extra weight of all the dirt for the new roadway. We believe that this brick line would not be able to handle this extra weight. I have tried to describe to you several of the challenges to start the design of this project. So how do we go about tackling this job and start designing? Well, the first thing that we did was get a survey. You may have seen some of these survey crews while driving in the area, or you were contacted to be, on, to be able to get onto your property to survey. We needed this done so we could get an overall view of the project and to come up with some ideas on how to design this project. We wanted to look at alternatives and put some costs as well as all the benefits and disadvantages of each alternative. Ultimately, we would provide our recommendation of the preferred alternative. This was done by our firm and presented to the city of Terre Haute, as well as to NDOT for their input and review. I'm, not, I'm now going to hand it over to Troy Willard of our firm, who is our lead road designer, who will lead you through what we came up with. Thanks, Mike. So <clears throat> I wanna start at the uh, beginning stages of the process. Um, Mike spoke on the need and purpose of the project earlier, uh, which is a focus on safety, emergency response times, and some traffic flow improvements to the area. Uh, in order to quantify some of these items, we started with a traffic study to understand the best way uh, to address these needs. We received traffic counts along both 13th Street and 8th Avenue from 2019, and a turning movement count at the existing signalized intersections uh, and a signalized intersection. Uh, then we projected those values out 20 years to, to ensure that we design not only a safe and quality project, uh, but also a project that will serve the area well for 20 years and beyond. We also looked a little deeper into the 21 trains that Mike had mentioned are using the track every day. At an average time of about 10 minutes per train block in the intersection, uh, that means both 13th Street and 8th Avenue cannot be crossed for nearly 15% uh, of a typical day. Uh, that's a pretty major inconvenience and a uh, big deal for the hospital uh, that's only a half a mile uh, to the west of the project. So after looking at those options uh, or those, those, that information, uh, we figured that the solution of a grade separation was uh, where we needed to head. However, uh, to quote a, quote a great movie, Field of Dreams, if you build it, they will come. So come to find out this uh, not only works for baseball fields in the late 80s, but also bridges over railroad tracks uh, today. With grade separation being the solution, uh, we now have a project, um, now have to project how much traffic from the surrounding area uh, will divert to this new option uh, so that they don't have to wait the five, 10, 15 minutes or more 
for the train tracks to clear. So based on some typical driver behavior, uh, other studies, we're projecting about 50% of the traffic that would typically wait at a train at 7th, 8th, 9th, Elm, Locust, 3rd Avenue, Ash Street, and Maple Avenue. We'll choose not to wait, uh, but divert to either 13th or 8th Avenue to go over the tracks uh, on our new project. So this, this kind of general traffic information um, played a pretty large role in figuring out uh, the uh, best solution uh, and intersection type to be able to handle the influxes of traffic during train events. So we kind of have three alternatives that we consider during this early design phase. One was one that we always consider as a no build um, where we leave the project at or leave the area as is. Um, the second was to build two bridges over the railroad track, one on 13th, one on 8th, and then leave the intersection as is with the traffic signal. And then we kind of came up with a different idea of, of one bridge uh, across the tracks with a roundabout pair um, at either end. So the no build alternative uh, quickly was removed from consideration. Uh, there's no improvement in the area, doesn't fulfill either the purpose or the need of the project that Mike had discussed. Um, so we, we kind of threw that one out right away. So on the, the next two slides, I'll, I'll show you the other two alternatives and discuss some major pieces uh, general cost and uh, the operational performance uh, of each one of those. So the first alternative uh, was installing two bridges uh, shown in pink on this figure. Uh, you can see um, one is on 13th Street. Um, it's on a little bit of an awkward skew and it, it passes over top of the railroad tracks. The other one's on 8th Avenue. The alignments of the roads stay the same um, and these will be fairly lengthy bridges. Uh, due to that awkward angle. And as Mike had said, uh, we need to make sure we have the vertical clearance for the entire width of the railroad right away. Now what I've shown in blue on this figure is how far the road would have to be replaced in order to bring the road back down to the existing elevation. Mike mentioned earlier, the, earlier uh, that we need 23 feet of clearance from the railroad tracks to the bottom of the bridge. However, the top of the pavement, which is where I'm working with, ends up being closer to 30 feet above the tracks uh, due to beams, concrete, and everything associated with constructing a bridge. From a road standpoint, uh, we have to go up about 30 feet uh, from the existing grade. It takes a lot of length um, to raise a road that high. I mean, you can only go so steep um, so that we uh, make it you know, safe for drivers, especially uh, if there's ever icy conditions or things like that. Uh, additionally, the new intersection at 13th and 8th uh, would be elevated somewhere in the range of 20 to 25 feet above where it is right now. Uh, just to, if you want to get a little bit of an idea of what that is or what that would really look like in reality, um, if you go out to the intersection right now and look at the very top of the signal heads where the red ball is, uh, those are right at about 20 feet in the air. So the new road would put it, for this option would be that much higher. Um, and, but still be a signalized intersection. In order to build these two bridges and handle all the new asphalt and walls associated with the project, uh, this, is would, this is gonna run about $19.2 million uh, with 6.3 being for the bridges and 12.9 being for the road work and, and the walls. As far as the performance goes, um, for traffic flow, um, we use a level of service uh, for an intersection it's a scale that runs from A to F, uh, with A being the best and F being the worst, uh, similar to how you know your grades work in school. Uh, a level of service D is considered acceptable. Um, so anything from D to A is considered an acceptable uh, level of service, and then an E or an F is considered failing. Uh, so in the AM peak, uh, this, this option uh, provides a level of service B, and this is with the uh, 2039 projected volumes, which is the 20 year out projected volumes. And in the PM peak, uh, this would be a level service C. And similarly, uh, this is the 2039 uh, traffic volumes, both of which uh, include that 50% diversion that I spoke on briefly uh, during the train events. So, well, this is a viable option. Uh, I mean, if it's the need and purpose of the project, um, when we looked at this, we thought, well, maybe there is a a different way, a better way, a more creative way um, 
to to solve this um, this grade crossing issue. Um, so this is how we came to propose an additional alternate, uh, which is a roundabout pair with a shorter uh, bridge that's also perpendicular to the tracks uh, that's going to connect to roundabouts that are both elevated. So this figure uses the same color scheme uh, for a bridge and for asphalt, but I've added some green circles to just kind of show the center island um, of the proposed roundabouts. What we've been able to do with this design is build a bridge that is shorter than either, either of the two bridges in the other alternative and shorten the road impacts by having a curve in the roadway that can absorb some of that elevation change. Uh, in addition to those benefits, um, constructing these roundabouts instead of a traffic signal creates a less maintenance situation for the city. Uh, they won't have to maintain the traffic signal, which is electric costs, um, going and resetting if it goes in a flash, um, dealing with detection maintenance and failures. And um, additionally, roundabouts have been studied that uh, while they won't necessarily decrease the number of accidents that could happen at an intersection, they do typically decrease the severity of the accidents. Um, what that really could look like is instead of being able to turn left and get T-boned, um, now that's not feasible. Um, you, you could have a side swipe, which would be significantly less severe. Um, you know, you'd have a fender bender rather than uh, a pretty high, uh, high impact accident. So in order to build this alternative, um, we, we did some projected costs and you can see the bridge cost has come way, way down due to just the one shorter bridge um, instead of the two long um, bridges that are on that skew. So we went from about, you know, a little over six million for the bridges uh, in the two bridge alternative. So this is down underneath under two million at 1.7. And then the road work is very comparable still to what it was before, but at 11.1 for an all in uh, construction cost of about 12.8 million, which if you compare to the previous one at 19.2 is about, <clears throat> you know, right around closer to cl close to six and a half million in savings. <clears throat> so finally, uh, I want to talk about the operational performance. Um, so from an operation standpoint, um, this performs um, more efficiently in the AM peak than the two bridge alternative. It's at a level of service A as opposed to a B, um, and it's equal uh, to the other one uh, in the PM peak. All that being said, uh, for the two alternatives, uh, we've chosen with the city and within not to move forward with the uh, design of the one bridge alternative with roundabout pairs um, at either end. So with that, uh, I'll pass this over to Brent. Uh, he can, is going to discuss some of the right-of-way process, how that plays into the construction of the project. Go ahead, Brent. Thank you, Troy. Now we will move on to discuss land acquisition for this project. In short, land acquisition is the means by which private lands are acquired for public purposes, a process with specific timelines and procedures performed by experts in their field. Good day, my name is Brent Friend, the right-of-way manager at BFNS, consulting firm for INDOT. We will be responsible for all components of land acquisition on this project. Today, we will be providing you with a general view of these components to provide some insight on how property is purchased for projects of this nature. Generally speaking, this project adjoins 31 distinct landowners as depicted on this exhibit. A majority are impacted in strips running along existing roads. However, several tracks coming into and out of the roundabouts are more heavily impacted. Terre Haute will ultimately need perpetual access to these lands for maintenance of this facility. A two-step process has been developed to address these impacts equitably with all landowners. The first task in that process is right-of-way engineering. This involves identifying the property owners and describing the real estate for purchase. The second is right-of-way services, that is appraising, buying, and potentially relocating landowners. The first step in right-of-way engineering is to identify landowners. This is done through title and encumbrance reports. A title provider will research the county records for a minimum of 20 years. 
to identify owners, mortgages, easements, and judgments, as well as the status of taxes. That information will be used to depict such interests in plan development and to identify those encumbrances that need to be cleared during the appraising and buying process. Having information on the properties and through coordination with INDOT and the design team, we will identify the property required for the project. The example before you is preliminary, but typical of impacts in the project area. The property boundary is delineated in green and the extents of construction are shown with a dashed line. With proposed roundabout, permanent right-of-way will be required as shown in pink. It is that property that needs to be acquired for the project. One of our licensed land surveyors will describe all properties needed for use in appraising, buying, and conveying the property. The second task, described earlier as right-of-way services. Guidance for land acquisition is provided for in the Constitution and in the United States and Indiana codes. At their core, these statutes define just compensation for property acquired for public use as well as due process in these acquisitions. Appraisals are completed to determine fair market value. Typically, these begin with an in-person inspection in collaboration with the landowner. This gives the owner an opportunity to point out unusual or hidden features of the property, such as on-site tenants, presence of underground storage, other ownership interests, and items of personal property. These items all contribute to the property value. Once complete, the appraisals are reviewed by a second licensed appraiser as a check on the values. The final determined value is approved for purchase. All impacted landowners will receive a written offer that explains the amount of just compensation, the procedures in conveying the property, and the time frame for accepting or rejecting the offer. At this time, the landowner has another opportunity to present any information that they believe should have been considered in the valuation. Once in agreement, a deed of conveyance will be executed for purchase. Should the project cause the displacement of any person from their residence or business, those persons will be eligible for relocation assistance, another process dictated by federal and state law. Again, the law provides uniform and equitable treatment for any displacee in finding a suitable replacement property, which is decent, safe, and sanitary. A relocation agent will be assigned to these landowners to help guide them through the process. The relocation agent is engaged as soon as the displacement is determined and often starts working with the landowner at the time of appraising. We've assembled a team which includes five additional consulting firms in line with completing the project efficiently and most importantly, having a local firm familiar with the Terre Haute area complete the appraisals. And now I'd like to turn the discussion over to Mike Mattel to discuss maintenance of traffic. Thank you, Brett. Now that we have shown you what is being planned for this project, you may have a question. How does this construction affect me? Well, in our Indiana standard specification book, which serves sort of as a type of rule book for the contractor, it has a section in it that addresses access to properties within the construction area. It tells the contractor that all property owners shall have access to their property during construction. Now, due to the complexity of this project and the amount of construction taking place at the intersection of 8th Avenue and 13th Street, both of these streets will be closed during construction. In our plans, we'll have an official detour route. People who live near the project site 
or are very familiar with this section of Terre Haute will be able to find their own way around and will probably only use portions of this detour route. I'd like to take a minute and just quickly go through the official detour route. Now, 13th Street will be closed with barricades at Locust Street, which is south of the project. And there will also be barricades at Maple Street, which is north of the project. Now, 8th Avenue will be closed with barricades at US 41, which is west of the project, and at 19th Street, which is east of the project. As you can see, this is quite a big detour, but this will hopefully keep as many uh, cars and vehicles uh, out of the construction area. Now, when all of this is going to, well, when is all this going to occur? I would like to go over what our current schedule of or timeline that we have today. We hope to keep this on schedule. All right. I, as well as Troy, talked earlier about the engineering report, which we presented our alternatives to the city as well as NDOT. This report was officially approved this past July. At that time, we could start putting together our design plans. Well, our next major milestone is to receive approval of the draft environmental document, which we are hoping will occur this June. When this document gets approved, we are then able to set up an official public hearing in August of this year. Now, this public hearing will be very similar to this meeting. God willing, we will be able to conduct this meeting in person and not virtually. At this meeting, we'll provide you some of the same information, but we will also be further along in our design plans to show you how this project will affect each one of you. Now, this public hearing will be transcribed and entered into what we call the final environmental report. You will be at this public hearing, you will be able to ask questions as well as comment and record on record about this project. So once we get through the public hearing, we hope to have the final environmental document approved by the end of this September. Now at that time, as Brent mentioned, we would be able to then contact you concerning any property negotiations. Now this project is scheduled for an April of 2023 letting. This is when the contractors look at our plans and contract book and provide a bid to say how much they will willing to build, how much it will cost to build this project. In most cases, NDOT chooses the low bid and construction would start in the early summer of 2023. It is anticipated that this construction will take approximately 18 to 24 months. This concludes our presentation and I will hand it back over to Scott for any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I hope everyone enjoyed that detailed presentation covering the timeline and scope of the project. We have received four questions at the moment. Uh, I would like to instruct anyone who was not at the beginning of the presentation when we provided instructions regarding questions uh, how to do that. You have two options. The first option is in your go to webinar control panel. You may select questions and type out your question or you may raise your hand using that feature virtually as well too and we will uh, work to facilitate that. If it's okay with you, Mr. Mattel, I will go ahead and call on our first question. Go right ahead. Thank you, sir. This question comes from uh, William or Bill Heyman. Could you please tell me if our properties will be involved both the old building and our current property consisting of eight lots. 
Bill, we're not exactly sure which properties those are, unless someone has more information. Bill, could you could you let us know? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Took me a second. I apologize. Uh, I typed that in before I saw whether the project was actually going to be um, a diagonal or two separate overpasses. Uh, I own Atlantis at 13th and 8th Avenue. It's an aquarium shop. Uh, the building we're in currently sits on eight lots at the corner of 13th and 8th Avenue. And we have a property, our old building uh, at 13th and 8th Avenue on the west side, or I'm sorry, on the east side of 13th Street at 8th Avenue. So basically the two commercial buildings at the corner of 13th and 8th Avenue. And I'm asked this question a dozen times a day. Uh, what's the future of this business? And I don't have a clue. So that's that's kind of where we are. Uh, Bill, this is Mike. Mike Michelle. Um, as we said in our presentation, uh, the height of that intersection is going to be raised about 25 feet plus or minus. So there's a very there's a very good possibility, or or it's going to happen that the, your property will 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 lose that property there. Uh, it's a very good question. Uh, it's it's going to be happening in right away negotiations, uh, but there's only so much we can do right now with that intersection being 20 feet, 25 feet up in the air, that uh, uh, your your property will be impacted greatly, and uh, I, I know we'll be having discussions with you. Sure. Okay. Well, uh, and I apologize for getting in late on this, so I will get back with someone in person. Uh, I know a lot of the other neighbors are interested as well, so I, I kind of speak on their behalf as well. Uh, as soon as somebody can get out to us all and let us know so we can kind of uh, make plans for our future. Um, uh, we think it's a great project. We wish you the best going forward. It's something Terre Haute's needed for a long time, and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bill. Bill, thank you so much for joining us. We do plan to have a uh, second location, likely in the next 14 days or so, somewhere in the vicinity of the project, and we will be sharing that um, via Terre Haute social media channels and other networks uh, in the coming days. But we'll make sure that that information is communicated to you as well. Excuse me one second here. Our second question comes from uh, Karen Schultz. How will this affect the first block of 13th Street North of 8th Avenue? As the last photo was published, I see no sidewalks or parking lots. Uh, Karen, uh, I would like to say that uh, sidewalks will be provided on 13th Street as well as 8th Avenue. Uh, as you go further north or south uh, from the intersection there on 13th Street, the, the amount of impacts to properties uh, diminish because we don't have our construction limits are able to come in further. Uh, be, I don't know specifics on, on where actually lots you're talking about, but as, as I said, the the closer you are to the intersection, uh, the greater possibility of, of impacts are going to be to those properties. I, I hope I answered that question as best as I could. I cannot unmute her. She has. Okay. Uh, Karen did give a specific address 1644 North 13th Street. Okay. What we can do, Karen, is we, I don't have a set of plans in front of me right now, uh, but we can uh, look at that and, and we'll, we'll get back with you on, on, on the type of uh, uh, right-of-way concerns for your property there at, at your address. The first of two questions, uh, the next two questions come from Kathy. 
Kathy would like to know, how do we plan to deal with semi trucks that use these roads and intersections when it comes to roundabouts? Okay, Kathy, that, that is a road question. I'm, I'm a, a bridge guy, so I'm going to uh, let Troy Willard, who is our uh, road engineer, uh, address that question. Thanks, Mike. Um, yeah, that's a good question, Kathy. Um, because I think that um, this is going to be one of the one of the first or if not the first roundabout in this area. Um, when we go through and, and, and design roundabout, some of the design criteria we have to take into play is um, semi trucks being able to go through them. Um, additionally, uh, I've already had communication with the local fire department to ensure that their largest fire truck can also uh, make it through these roundabouts. Uh, when we get into the really detailed design, um, we look at how much of a truck apron we can put on the inside of the roundabout so that the back tires of semi trucks um, can get, utilize that as a traversable area as well. Um, so we will make sure uh, as we go through the design process um, that semis and uh, any other of the larger vehicles, school buses, um, fire trucks will be able to get through this. Thank you. Follow uh, question number two from Kathy, um, following along the, that same topic somewhat. Uh, how can we close 8th Avenue through US 41 with both Union Hospital and Hamilton Center, as well as the other medical buildings in the vicinity on 8th Avenue? Uh, Kathy, that, that's a good question. Uh, when I say close it, uh, we will be putting in uh, barricades that cars still will be able to get through at US 41 to the hospital. Uh, that will be taken care of and coordinated with the hospital as well as the contractor and as well as uh, the inspectors that are on the job. Uh, no, undoubtedly, we will not totally close off the street uh, due to that. Where we will totally close off the project is where our construction limits are at the at the termini of the project, which may be oh two to three, four blocks from that intersection where the contractor is actually building the project. Cars will not be able to get through there, but uh, near the hospital, cars will still be able to get through to the hospital when using Eighth uh, Avenue. That was a very good question. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, we have two questions from Paul. The first is, is there an estimate when right-of-way maps for this project will be finalized? Um, I'm going to, uh, uh, since that's a real technical right-of-way question, I'm going to uh, uh, send that off to Brent Friend, who, who's here tonight, uh, who's our right-of-way manager. Thank you, Mike. And yes, the question uh, related to right-of-way maps, uh, will they will be finalized in the coming uh, months. As far as the impacts to properties, uh, what we're looking at at this stage is that we've got some stage two plans that have gone in for consideration. That's very close to what uh, the ultimate footprint will be. Uh, and so at that time, when those are approved, which will be within the next several weeks, uh, we will begin actual right-of-way engineering. And so with that, uh, we will finalize the actual plan set, which is the overall plan uh, for the project, as well as individual impacts to the properties. Uh, and so that will be done here. Uh, we're targeting uh, the beginning of May for when all that uh, will be finalized. We have a second question from Paul, and, and this question is, are there any considerations given to acquire the property in the vicinity of the project, but not necessarily within the project footprint? I'm concerned my residential property will be less marketable and ultimately devalued as a result of this project. Thank you, Paul. I'm also gonna send that over to Brent. Uh, 
to address that question, if you could, please, Brent. I will, Mike. Thank you, uh, Paul. What we will do during the course of right of way acquisition is uh, we study the construction plans to discern where the construction limits hit actual private property. And it's only those particular properties that are impacted by construction that are considered for acquisition. So to answer your question, if you're outside the footprint of the construction of the project, uh, there will be no acquisition on that particular property. Thank you. We have two questions from Gary. Uh, the first of which is, when the project is completed, will there be ground level crossings for pedestrians and bicyclists? When you say, uh, Gary, uh, to be clear, there, there will be sidewalks on the bridge. Uh, there will be sidewalks leading up to the bridge on both 13th Street and 8th Avenue. If you are talking about at ground level where ground is today near those intersections, uh, near that intersection, there will not be uh, any trails underneath uh, that are planned right now underneath on the railroad property. But uh, there will be, um, like I said, sidewalks uh, leading up to and on the bridge itself. I hope that answers your question. Gary, feel free to, uh, if it did not, to submit a follow-up and we'll make sure to address it. Uh, Gary did have a second qu uh, question, which is, will the Dairy Queen uh, at, at 6th, 5th, and 4th Avenue be impacted on the egresses? I know where the Dairy Queen is. I, I had lunch there once, but so um, Dairy Queen is, I believe, is just north of 6th Avenue, uh, or, or is it south of 6th Avenue? I don't believe off the top of my head if Dairy Queen is going to be impacted or not. Uh, Brent, do you know off the top of your head if 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 we're going to be disturbing that fine eatery? Yeah, I'm sorry, I had to hit my unmute button. Uh, the Dairy Queen falls just slightly south of the construction limits. It's so the construction limits right now go just extend south of Sixth Avenue by uh, by several feet, but not quite to the point where it would impact the Dairy Queen. I don't know about anybody else, but that makes me feel better. <laughs> we have another question this evening from Karen, or Karen, oh, I apologize, Karen, that's your address from earlier. Uh, we have a question from Earl. Earl asks, can we provide email addresses to be sure that we are notified of any future meetings or webinars? We live at 1640 North 13th Street. Or that might be Avenue, 13th Avenue, I apologize. Earl Bruner. Earl, we do have your email address. We do have your address. And if you are impacted by this project, uh, you will be uh, coordinated with spoken with and uh and we will be very upfront with you and in, in, in anything we we do with regards to this project thank you we have one more follow-up question from kathy this evening she has a question about what about spencer ballpark that's a very good question kathy spencer ballpark is on the east side of this project. Uh, one of the main uh, objectives of this project was to not disturb Spencer Park at, uh, if, at all, since that would get us into uh, a very complicated environmental type of thing due to uh, uh, impacting a park. So, uh, this project it terminates right at the corner, right at the corner of, I believe, just east of the bridge, 
we are we do not get into Spencer Park to Thank you. Do we have any additional questions this evening? We'll give everyone just, just a moment if in case anyone is typing. Seeing no new questions and no hands raised, uh, Mr. Mattel, would it be okay if we go ahead and closed out this evening? I'm, I'm, it does look like we have one more. It looks like Bill Foster yes. may have a question. Oh, thank you very much. We do have one additional question here from Bill Foster. How um, to access our facility? Uh, Bill, do you have an address? Uh, I can. This would be the railroad museum off of uh, Plum Street. Okay. Yeah, I sent us. I sent a message earlier, but didn't go through. Mm. We were just east of 13th on Plum Street, between 13th and the Thank railroad. You, sir. Bill, I'm going. Mike Mattel, I can. I can take Troy this one. Take care of this one because Troy has looked at that. Railroad Museum quite thoroughly when they were putting together their road design. So go ahead, Troy. So that the Railroad Museum right there on Plum Street, um, when we are bringing the northern piece of 13th Street back down to grade, um, we are there's going to be a wall on both sides of the road there, and we're going to come down as quick as possible and leave Plum Street open at the conclusion of the project. Um, we're not fully certain if we're going to need to turn a wall for a short period along Plum Street, but the intent of the project is to leave Plum Street open um, and still give you access to that drive and that, um, I believe it's a gravel lot right there um, at the railroad um, museum. Okay. My other question that didn't come through in the text was is this presentation something that we can download so I can pass it on to my board of directors? That's a good question for Scott to handle. Yeah, thank you very much. Yep, it is our plan uh, to provide this, a recorded link to this video uh, to the city of Terre Haute. Um, I've, I've been in conversations with Marcus, the assistant city engineer, to publish to the to a, a location on the on the city website and for them to share uh, in any manner that they deem appropriate for, for public um, review. Okay, I appreciate it. I'm, I'm using the mobile app and it's kind of tough to navigate some of it. Yeah, thank you, sir. We'll make sure that we can communicate that back to you. Thank you. Any additional questions this evening? Well, I'd like to take a moment to thank everyone who uh, took time of their schedule to participate in this virtual public uh, informational meeting. Uh, we hope that it was of value to those of you who attended. Uh, we look forward to continuing to work in a collaborative fashion. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we are working with the city to identify a location uh, in the coming weeks to um, have members of the BFS team show be in Terre Haute with uh, illustrations and boards and, and, and just generally be available to answer any questions um, that the public may have at that time. Once that facility and location and time date have been secured, it will be shared and passed along as well. Um, with that, uh, thank you all of you again for attending this public information meeting on the upcoming 13th Street and 8th Avenue railroad grade separation. Um, we look forward to the coming projects and we wish you all a wonderful evening. Thanks for bearing with us in this virtual presentation.